Alright, well after that dinner table scene, we are moved up to our room, which we are sharing with our friend Lillian. Uh, she is the one that invited us to this weekend, if we forget. Uh, there was an announcement at dinner where Colonel uh, Dijon said that he was going to share his fortune equally with everyone there, except us, um, us not being related, when he died, and if anyone died before he did, everyone else would get their share of money. So everyone now has a great motive for murder, and we're all isolated on this island. Everyone then started bad-mouthing Henri as soon as he left with his maid Fifi, except for Lillian, who was very upset by it. Uh, Laura thinks that something is strange, everyone is acting oddly, which I guess it's a very strange situation, so that's not all that bizarre. So the first thing to do, obviously, is to get advice from Ghost Dad. So, let's see, here we go. This is John Bow, who I'm calling Ghost Dad. I don't know if he's actually dead now. Um, he is Laura's father. He was a renowned detective and was very successful at that, so he gives us some sort of good general detective advice throughout the game. Uh, be unobtrusive, take a lot of notes. Um, it's this question the others that raising suspicion. I don't think you can actually raise suspicion by questioning, so we're going to ask everyone absolutely everything, but that's neither here nor there. We will take our notebook and take notes all throughout the game. This sort of feels half done. You're allowed to see Laura's notes at the very end of the game, but never during the game. And while taking uh, notes is sort of an important part of it, I feel like that's something we should have access to. So I've shown us a close-up of her notebook here, and I will be including in the game a little notebook icon and a tone. Anytime, there it is. Anytime you see that, you can click on it uh, for more information. There is a um, review of everyone who is present if you want to click on it now. I guess you already have. Uh, so let's just move around a little bit, get familiar with the controls, move with the arrow keys. Everything is done with a text parser. Every action, uh, or, or talking to someone, or picking anything up. Uh, so we notice that the room looks kind of nice. There's a painting with strange hollow eyes. And to begin with, uh, since chapter one is kind of a big one, I'm going to move us out into the hallway and give you the freedom of choice. There is a side quest that takes place outside, or the main quest that takes place inside. Outside is puzzles, inside is dealing with people. So I'll let you choose here, uh, pick whichever you like, and I'll see you after the break. Okay, I guess we've chosen to go for the main quest, so we will be seeing what's going on with the family of Colonel Dijon inside the house. Uh, let's begin with exploration of the top floor of the mansion, and let's begin that with seeing whose room adjoins ours. Okay, it looks like Ethel is in this room, if we remember, that's Colonel Dijon's sister, uh, and the mother of Lillian. She is already starting to drink. I don't know if that's supposed to look like a water glass, but I assure you it is not. Um, not sure if the name Ethel is supposed to be a pun because, you know, ethyl alcohol, but if it was, then that was a very astute pun, because she will be getting drunker as the night goes on. I'm going to include, after every um, person that I talk to, a screenshot of what they think about everyone else. You're allowed to ask everyone about everyone, but that's sort of too dull to put you through watching me ask everyone about everyone. So we'll just have a summarizing screenshot after each one. So, Ethel wanted to know where Lillian was, and the last we heard was that Lillian was going to go freshen up in the bathroom. So, let's go ahead and check on her. Uh, we know that that is at the end of the hallway. It's kind of a nice old place, but you can see cracks just about everywhere, which is supposed to indicate that Colonel Dijon isn't keeping uh, the best care of his house. He doesn't spend a lot of money, is the idea. He does apparently have a modern bathroom, so apparently that's important to him. And I can understand the ride through the bayou sort of frazzling her. Keep in mind, if you see something that looks like dialect, like plum frazzled, this is all in Louisiana, so everything that's happening is sort of with this thick Creole accent. I like how Laura's kind of passive-aggressive in a lot of her descriptions. 
you know, she's your friend, but unlike you, she'll hang out in the speakeasies, which are bars during the 1920s, uh, smoke and run around with young men. So, you're her good friend, uh, but she's really obnoxious, and you think that underneath it all, she's incredibly lonely. Now, this is sort of odd. You're supposed to look at Lillian twice here, because one of the things you're supposed to figure out is that people have distinctive scents. Hers is perfume, and you only get that if you look at her twice right now. And it doesn't actually tell you that she's applying perfume, and you can't smell her, that doesn't do anything. Um, so that sort of seems half done. Anyway, on to the first of the secrets that we probably wouldn't know unless we were psychic. We'll assume this is a replay of the game. We pull on the armoire, and we reveal a secret passage. So it looks like in here, uh, we can sort of move in between the two rooms, we can see paintings to either side, and I wonder if the fact that we can see paintings relates to how Laura described some of the paintings in the rooms as hollow or having hollow eyes. Well, she doesn't see any pictures, even though there's clearly a picture frame in the back of the wall. Let's see about looking through the eyes. Uh, she doesn't see anything special, probably because she's looking at her own eyes right now. You need to be sort of clear with little Laura. And there we go. I love the way that she moves her eyes back and forth like that. I guess she just wants to take in every detail. Uh, so there are eyes in each of these, and you can see sort of a doorway. And there's one over here where this cutaway is. That is a secret panel that allows you to move uh, from the secret passage into the room. Now. This is not going to be important for us to do in the story. I think they were probably inserted as a way of explaining some things that happened later. Um, either way, we now know that in this at least particular part of the hallway, we can gaze into these rooms uh, without being detected, because apparently no one sees eyes in the horse darting back and forth. So let's see what's going on in the Colonel's room. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it is Colonel Dijon and the now this is an important event, and it advanced the clock by 15 minutes. This would have been the same if we had just gone right in the room, or if we had looked through the secret passage. Obviously we wouldn't have seen this whole scene uh, if we were just barging right in. It would have been sort of truncated, and I might show that later. Uh, but looking through the secret passages before you enter into rooms is always a good idea. So, we can see that if anyone had any suspicions about Fifi being kind of a gold digger and kind of playing Colonel Dijon for his money, well, they weren't that far off. They were both uh, having naked times, and now they are both dressed, and it's not clear how much the Colonel knows what's going on in terms of gold digging. I love how, oh no, there's somebody in the room as if he didn't see this happening and know that you saw it. He, this is not acknowledged in game. They don't store that information, so you can just assume that his, his back was turned or something. So we now know our first incriminating piece of evidence that Fifi is in a relationship with the Colonels, which must be uh, money-based. We can assume. Um, it's hard to believe that she's really very attracted to this frail old man smoking his cigar. But, uh, something at least seems to be agitating the old man. He is fidgeting in his wheelchair and watching us suspiciously. Maybe he just saw us open the panel and doesn't know how much we saw. I don't know. <laughs> He's so antisocial, too. Just, Go away, I hate you and everyone. We are looking at his cigar again to get, um, his scent. It's interesting how... The game doesn't really acknowledge this, but um, if you look at someone or look at something that they are smoking or wearing that would have a scent, uh, then you sort of notice it. Except again for Lillian, you can't look at her perfume, you must simply uh, look at her twice. So it seems like uh, adjacent to the Colonel's room is Dr. Feel's room. Uh, which I guess makes sense. They want him on hand in case there's any medical emergencies. He's not in right now, but his medicine bag is there, which we take careful note of. It's probably got all sorts of uh, delicious poisons and, and things in it. So that does it with that little branch here. 
Now, if we remember right, uh, we will remember that Ethel wanted to talk to Lillian. Now, we could go back in and see what they were talking about, but seeing as there are identical armoires on both sides of the hallway, it's probably a pretty good guess that there is another secret, and there is! There is another secret passage. Um, this one is going to be identical to the one on the other side. I like how um, Laura is going to be surprised at every secret thing we find, even when they stop being surprised. Like, this was sort of expected, she will still be blown away. But anyway, let's sort of spy on the mother-daughter conversation. And so we can see that Ethel really doesn't think that uh, some of the people deserve any of the money, not being blood relatives. Look at that glass in hand. I don't know whose that is supposed to be. It is not Ethel's. She is apparently holding some dismembered arm and using it to raise a glass to her own lips because that angle is just... I don't know. Something is going on with that. So this is just a small scene showing that apparently Lillian and Ethel do not get along. Alright, well let's uh, move this other panel that will put us into Rudy and Clarence's room. So, I guess the men and the women sort of sleep together. Uh, I, no one's married, I suppose. So, this being the 1920s and all, we do separate the sexes in that way. That just about does it for upstairs for now. Uh, we have investigated everything. Uh, we're sort of in the upstairs hallway now. You can see that chandelier rattling back and forth. We could look in that closet, but there's really nothing in there. We could go upstairs, but there's... well, we'll do that later. Uh, so for now, let's investigate the bottom floor. Kind of a nice place, with the, uh, you know, the grand stairways uh, going both ways, the suit of armor, uh, chandelier as we know up above, that purple couch, which I guess you could sit on if you wanted to um, see the entrance way. I don't know. Now, I said before that we want to do secret passages before just barging into rooms. In this chapter, uh, these two places don't penalize you at all, and we get to see the descriptions of the room and what's in there. So the Colonel apparently uh, has kind of a funky side too, he likes billiards, the Victrola. Um, now these, every uh, time we walk into one of these rooms and see a conversation, we're advancing the plot by 15 minutes. Sometimes there are things you can miss if you advance the plot too quickly get annoying later. For now, we're pretty much safe. There's only a few events and you're not going to miss anything. Uh, you will see that characters are hesitant to talk when we're around. They're going to want to wait for us um, to be gone. And that's, again, the use of the secret passages. We get in there and we can uh, sort of hear them. So here's Gloria and Ruby, brother and sister. Um, both Gertie's children. And so Dijon's through and through. Apparently, Rudy Dijon is just the business when it comes to looking attractive. Look at that face. That is an attractive face. With that mustache. I think when I was a kid, I thought that was his mouth, and he was just like, mm, all the time. He was just very upset. But no, that is his handsome mustache. And just uh, affirming again, neither one of them are really very interested in talking to us. The eyebrows in this game are one of the high points for me. They're just... Mm, mm. So we know the billiards room is there. Let's see what's across the hallway. This appears to be the parlor. Now that's going to translate to a few things, but mainly it is the drinking room. Interestingly, seeing as this is 1925, this is in an illegal room because there is a big decanter of cognac there. Um, that is not legal to have, but apparently the colonel does not care. He lives here all by himself. Uh, I wonder which one of his staff works with criminals to get that cognac. I wonder if uh, Jeeves does that or something. Anyway, this is uh, Gertie, um, Colonel Dijon's sister-in-law, apparently married uh, Colonel Henri's brother, who is now dead. We don't know her maiden name, but uh, she goes by Dijon, so that's fine. And Clarence the lawyer. They've apparently struck up a conversation. 
Uh, also notice the parrot in here. We will, in fact, be paying more attention to the parrot later. But, as with the other couple in the other room, neither of these two are especially interested in talking to us. So let's leave them be. And continue down the hallway and see if there's anything interesting for us to find. After we just get our descriptions of these people. He does look dapper, doesn't he? That uh, speckled gray and brown hair, the face that could not look more upset. That man is a lawyer through and through. People seem to dress pretty garishly down here. You see a lot of black suits. Maybe it's a southern thing. Maybe up north it was just uh, black suits, but down here it's a lot of purples and greens. Anyway, that's enough of this room. Let's head up. And if we remember the hallway above, there were armoires on both sides of the hallway. Here we see, in roughly the same position, a grandfather clock and a mirror. So, hmm, wonder if that is anything. If we look at the clock, we can get a picture of what time it is, just in case we happen to have forgotten. Um, and let's uh, just, for old time's sake, try to move the... And hey, we found a secret passage. Laura is exactly as surprised as she was before, putting exclamation points after the find and everything. And a uh, small hidden room in the house, once again. There are a lot of paintings with hollow eyes in this house. And a lot of unobservant people, apparently. I like to think that if uh, a painting just suddenly got eyes, and started looking back and forth, then I would uh, notice. So... While, uh, while Ethel and Lillian's conversation may not have been that enlightening beyond the fact uh, that Ethel just doesn't like people, which no one really likes anyone in this house, so um, that's not so crazy. This one is a little better. This uh, beginning is just sort of them talking bad about Henri as they are uh, inclined to do. Again, this is uh, Rudy and Gloria. We learn first that they are suspicious of Fifi. We also learn... Um, that I, I need to go back and look. Or I probably already got it, but uh, Gloria smokes cigarettes, so that will be another scent clue. Gloria's last name that she lists is Swan Song, but uh, because she is the, the sister of Rudy, we can guess that that's just a stage name that she's taken on. We also learned that uh, Gloria is in a relationship with Clarence, the lawyer, who seems a little older and, and lamer than her, I guess, but that she has a new boyfriend who is a director, that she wants to break it off with him. Apparently hasn't yet. Um, might be afraid of him. Rudy certainly think, seems to think he's going to take it badly. And then right after that, uh, for some reason, her breaking up seems to remind her of her medical problem that she had. So she had some very embarrassing medical problem that Wilbur knows about. Uh, Wilbur is the doctor. We haven't really met him yet, but we will in just a little bit. So, two juicy pieces of information there. that Clarence is going to be upset fairly soon with her, and that um, she has some unspecified as of yet medical problem. Well, here's this mirror on the other side of the hallway, and what happens if we move it, do you think? Well, I will be. We can push it and find a secret door. So let's go on in, and maybe find out a little bit more about what Clarence and Gertie were talking about. Gertrude. But I call her Gertie. Because we are good friends. So, Clarence is complaining about his money problems to Gertie. Her eyebrow might be my favorite in the entire game. I just, they capture her looking haughty so well. Not like she is a hottie, but she is looking haughty. I guess they're trying for sort of an environmental message here, like he's a bad guy because he's going to exploit a swamp. I don't know why anyone would, I don't think Gertie would care that he's going to exploit the land. But even though Ethel doesn't like Gertie at all, Clarence seems to think the two of them are close. And 
and things are turning sour quickly. We can see Clarence is being a little belligerent. Uh, that well might continue into the rest of the game. And here is our next juicy piece of information. It looks like Clarence has run some kind of racehorse scam. Uh, we don't really know what it is, but we know that he probably wouldn't want the Colonel finding out about it, and that uh, Gertie knows about it. So there is a fight broken up. I think we forgot to take a look at Polly earlier, uh, who is the parrot that was in that room. Since we saw the fight between Gertie and Rudy, and uh, Clarence, I mean, uh, Gertie will be gone. She's gone someplace else. The game does keep track of where everyone is supposed to be and has them there. Um, Jeeves, in particular, goes about the island kind of a lot, um, doing various chores and duties, and you can actually follow him and it keeps track of where he's supposed to be. That's pretty cool. Um, Ethel will also be uh, wandering around later. There's Polly. Nothing to really to say to us so far, but we will be back, my parent friend. Um, there is one notable exception, uh, which we will get into a little bit later, about uh, the game sort of keeping track of where everybody is and you being able to follow them. They do it for a good reason. Uh, they really could not have done things otherwise and had this be a game. Oh, hey, we caught Jeeves. I mentioned that he uh, walks around a lot and has a lot of chores, so there's not really a set place you're going to... Well, I mean, depending on when you find him, he'll always be in a set place, but uh, it can be a little tricky to find him in the first act, so I'm glad we did. He is creepy. His chores, at least in the beginning here, seem to revolve around uh, offering everybody drinks. As far as I know, nobody accepts, uh, because the big drinkers have already sort of helped themselves. So we found the, uh, the front and the back hallway. Let's see what's in this set of rooms over here. This appears to be the library. As far as I know, this is not a scene that benefits from looking in at the secret passage. It's just Gloria coming in and pretty sure that Wilbur's about to spill the beans on her. Whatever the beans are, we don't know about the beans yet. But, I mean, if she wants to keep it quiet, there's probably other ways than talking really, I just, whatever, I don't care, I'm just a doctor. There's probably better ways than to just shout about it. I don't know if he's threatened to do it, or if there's some reason she thinks it's going to happen, or maybe her medical problem uh, makes her more likely to believe ill of others that they are plotting against her. And here we see dirty old man Wilbur C. Fields in action. And they're confirmed dirty old man. Um, yeah, just sitting in the library, reading his books and looking at the women who come by. He's got kind of a creepy smile on him, and he looks a little like Colonel Sanders to me, just personally. Now, people talk about Wilbur sampling his own wares a lot throughout the course of this game. I, I think that's supposed to mean he maybe drugs himself up a little bit. It could also be related to the fact that at this time in 1925, much medical practice uh, consisted of taking small amounts of things in alcohol. Uh, much like homeopathic medicine today is very dilute substances taken in water, back then it was taken in alcohol, which arguably uh, would cure your perception of a lot of the uh, problems you might have. This is again very passive-aggressive description. She's probably apt in her duties, whatever they might be like being a whore or a prostitute or whatever. And there is apparently a cunning beneath her personality. 
and she does not have time to talk. She is cleaning this study, and nothing is going to stop her. So apparently, the colonel is sort of a world traveler. He has got uh, a prized Derringer, which is a small handgun, on his table there. He has gone to Africa, you can see by that rhino head and crossed spears. He has in his cabinets some interesting things a rifle collection, so if there's going to be murders it might be handy to know where all the rifles are. And there is another cabinet in here with that alligator on it. Let's take a look at that rhino. That is a huge rhino head. And the game doesn't talk about him going on safari or anything anyplace else, so uh, he might have got this by mail order or something for all I know. Maybe one of his... maybe, maybe Jeeves was a big game hunter back in the day or Wilbur or something, who knows. Uh, but looking in the other weapons cabinet here, we find sort of an eclectic mix. A boomerang, cutlass, dagger, mace, and crossbow. That, uh, that sounds like my weapons cabinet from, um, from Skyrim. Like the weird collection of weapons that I end up with at the end. Just everything that's unique. So maybe these are all just enchanted weapons or something like that. Otherwise, maybe they're just indicative of uh, particularly successful hunts, he said. I don't know. Here's Jeeves offering more drinks. You know what sounds great? Why don't we have a drink? I know we're only 20, but this is the 1920s, and this is illegal anyway, so... You know what? Let's get... let's get a... Oh, we don't care for liquor. It's the game's coy way of stepping out of things. I like how they, the problem isn't that we're 20 instead of 21, it's that we, we personally don't care for liquor. Remember kids, stay in school, don't drink, and solve mysteries at the same time. So, last little leg here, let's see what's on the right. Uh, the dining room, this is where we were at the beginning of the game during the intro sequence. Um, I don't know why I looked at that vase, but I guess just to show that there's a lot of knickknacks around. I like how, again, passive-aggressive, she's like, I guess the colonel has some class, at least he decorated this room. Doesn't look so good to me, a lot of purple. And here is the kitchen, one of the warmest, friendliest places. Here we see Seely, who is the last member uh, of the household that we have met, along with Beauregard the dog is a good old dog, and just like sitting by the, uh, by the fire, he's old, he's tired, but still loyal, doggone it, it's the way dogs should be. So, let's see what's going on with Seely, apparently just washing the dishes. Actually, first order of business is to pet the dog, and Laura's like, okay, whatever, pet the dog. Actually, first order of business is that. Second order of business is to get a little snack. Because we had to leave dinner early, because Lillian had her little freak out. And we are going to grab us a soup bone. We are gnawing on it, and it is going to be delicious. Because this is a Louisiana soup bone. So let's see what's going on with Seely. She's, she's minding her own business. We've heard that she practices voodoo. I wonder who we heard that from. Probably Lillian. It's the only person I can imagine telling us about that. But that is kind of a surprise. Well, that is everybody in the house. I've sort of teleported us back here so you don't have to watch me walk all the way back. Um, Sometimes the things that change acts, it's, it's just like advancing uh, the time. It's just walking in on a significant event. Sometimes the things that change the plot don't seem that significant. So, let's walk in and see the jaw-dropping Gertie is asleep. And that is the beginning of Act 2. Well, that is it for Act 1, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I will see you for Act 2 and maybe something a little bit more exciting than people talking is going to happen then. Alrighty. Catch you then.
Thank you.